This is the Story Punks podcast, the show where we talk about all the punks. So steampunk, diesel punk, cyberpunk, and all the other punks. Today I'm talking with Katie Wyland, who writes as K.M. Wyland, about diesel punk, gas lamp fantasy, and historical superhero fiction, among alternate history and many other topics. So I'm so thrilled. My name is Cindy Grigg. I'm the host of the Story Punks podcast, and I'm really excited to talk about her fiction, but also K.M. Wyland is a powerhouse when it comes to nonfiction for writers. So if you're telling a story of any kind, actually, not just a written story, you will probably be really benefited by checking out www.helpingwritersbecomeauthors.com. So I'm so excited to speak with her. And on that note of gas lamp fantasy, I am so excited today to do a little tribute to the person who created that term. Kaya Folio coined that term to describe her work, and she co-writes it with Phil. So Phil and Kaya Folio's work. They wrote the Girl Genius comic, so they create that comic throughout the year, and then they bundle it up and create a volume for the year, the Omnibus. And they also have some full-length novels you should check out. These have been up for numerous awards, which you can see on their site, girlgeniusonline.com. But you've probably heard of these. It's the Agatha H. and the Airship City novel. Book two is Agatha H. and the Clockwork Princess. And book three is Agatha H. and the Voice of the Castle. And in a Live Journal blog entry, she wrote, I called it Gas Lamp Fantasy because around the time we were bringing Girl Genius out, there was a comic called Steampunk on the shelves, and I didn't want any confusion. Plus, I've never liked the term steampunk much for our work. It's derived from cyberpunk, a term which I think actually fits its genre well. But we have no punk, and we have more than just steam, and using a different name seemed appropriate. I misremembered a term that I had come across in the foreword to an H. Ryder Haggard book, where the author was talking about Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, Ryder Haggard, and that sort of pre-pulp adventure material, and I came up with gas lamp fantasy. I felt a bit foolish when I discovered that I had made up my own term, but it works well and I like it and plenty of other people like it. This is a term you'll hear the more you get into these genres if you haven't heard of it already, or maybe you're coming to episodes like this one already knowing about gas lamp fantasy and you've thought that it was completely interchangeable with steampunk. I think that's okay too. That's actually where I came from with it. I thought it was seriously just a different way to talk about it, a different way to market it so that people could understand the time period that it was about gas lamp technology and such. That's exactly why we have this ongoing conversation on this show. So on girlgeniusonline.com, under new readers, they say, Girl Genius is an ongoing adventure story in which the characters grow, change, run around the landscape quite a bit, and occasionally even die. Because of this, we recommend that new readers start the Girl Genius story from the very beginning. Trust us, it makes more sense that way. The good news is that the entire archive is now available for online reading. So you can read those online archives, but then also you can use the more traditional, but much less free, method of reading the graphic novels, which are available at bookstores, comic shops, a growing number of public libraries, and of course, their own online shop. So this is a wonderful way to get those published collections that they bundle for you and it just looks gorgeous and you can have it in a print form. But if you wanna read it online, Isn't that awesome that they're offering that? So you could jump in and start reading Girl Genius today. The artwork is super fun. Everything they do is just really fun. For example, go to their Patreon page and you'll see that they have these videos of how they produce comics and they've done it in the style of historical fiction and gas lamp fantasy time period. And they're so witty and fun about it. Like I particularly loved when they're talking about (laughs) bundling together all the comics from the year and you see Kaya out there plucking the pages from a tree and putting them in her basket so she can bundle them together. It's just super whimsical, fun, and very intelligent. It's all about girl genius. So you're going to absolutely love it. Check it out. Again, that's found at girlgeniusonline.com. So just an awesome perspective point as we head into this interview and something I wanted to recommend to you as a story to check out. For my personal update, this week I've been getting ready for my local convention, which is Salt Lake Comic Con, but they've rebranded it to be called Salt Lake Fan X. 
And this happens twice a year. So it's a little smaller in the springtime. And then it, it's a bigger convention in the fall for some reason. I don't know the reasoning, but this smaller convention, I'll be on a couple panels and I'm really excited. Other than that, I've been working my day job, which I absolutely love. I am a technical writer. I write and I edit and I create instructional design. So sometimes it can be a little seasonal and that's really the name of the game right now. And it's just been really hitting me hard. So that's really all I have to report. And I hope to close the loop on some previous projects mentioned in earlier episodes. So thank you for those of you who have been reaching out, encouraging me and asking me about those projects. I'm really looking forward to getting back to those as I can. And so let's get into the interview. Remember, you can always watch this on YouTube. It is a video as well as an audio podcast. After recording this episode, I saw Beauty and the Beast with Emma Watson for the first time. And I thought, hmm, you know who Emma Watson reminds me of? Katie Wyland. <laughs> Katie Wyland, the author, is the standard to which the actress is compared. <laughs> and I think you'll agree because she's absolutely genius. Actually, they both are. Both, both Emma Watson and Katie Wyland. And with that introduction, here we go. K.M. Wyland lives in make-believe worlds, talks to imaginary friends, and survives primarily on chocolate truffles and espresso. She is the award-winning and internationally published author of acclaimed writing guides, as well as the gas lamp fantasy Wayfarer, the historical or diesel punk adventure Storming, the portal fantasy Dreamlander, the medieval epic Behold the Dawn, and the Western A Man Called Outlaw. When she's not making things up, she's busy mentoring other authors on her award-winning web website, Helping Writers Become Authors. She makes her home in Western Nebraska. So welcome onto the show, Katie. It's so wonderful to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that typewriter in the background or anything else in your office? Right? Yes. So this is my office and um, this wall is usually completely blank and I'm like, that's not going to work. It needs a background. So I, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to haul out my typewriter. It's so yeah, awesome. this is my a super Sterling Smith Corona typewriter. Um, one of my two piece typewriter collection, which hopefully will grow. But above here, I don't know if you can probably can't because of the glare. Oh, gorgeous. part of my golden Hollywood uh, gallery that uh, inspires me while I write. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. It's fun to see where people write and where the magic happens. So thank you. So on this show, we do focus on the punks. And as I mentioned in previous episodes, for anyone who's been following through season one and on to season two, this is one of the smaller categories, diesel punk. But we're also going to be talking about steampunk and gas lamp and many other if you feel so inclined. So let's start with definitions. Which of the punk or punk adjacent genres do you like the most and how would you define them? I think probably the best thing about all of the punk genres is that we have all of these amazing subgenres and they all have these amazing titles that go with them, which is really exciting. Um, so I'm always discovering, you know, all of these little subgenres that um, I didn't even know existed. And that's honestly how I get into a lot of the stuff that I write. I start writing something and then discover, oh, there, there's a subgenre. Other people are doing this. Um, that's actually totally how I realized that. Um, Wayfarer was Gaslit Fantasy because I, I originally conceived it as what I called a historical superhero story and um, was writing it as that and referred to it as that throughout pretty much the whole process of, of conception, outlining, researching, writing. And then not until I was getting ready to publish the book and I was investigating uh, keywords for marketing and that kind of thing, did I discover that there is this subgenre of steampunk that has this amazing name that is Gaslamp Fantasy, which I thought was just perfect. And I just loved it to pieces. Um, like diesel punk, it's a, you know, pretty small uh, subgenre, as I think most of them are. But yeah, I've, I've written in um, Gaslamp Fantasy now, um, diesel punk, as you mentioned. And I've just done, it seems like the steampunk vibe kind of uh, crawls into just about everything I write these days. So even in things that are more you know, actually epic fantasy, something in that genre, as my book Dreamlander was, even in that, the the punk element kind of crawls into it, and, and which is always kind of fun. 
So it just, it seems to be something that's just become a part of who I am as a writer, even though I didn't, I didn't actually intend for that to happen. It just kind of happened, which honestly, I think it makes it just that much more fun kind of to have it be something that, that sort of emanates out of who you are as a writer instead of something that you consciously choose to be. I totally think so as well. And that makes it much more organic. And it's, I think, something that a lot of people listening can relate to because sometimes people are into steampunk and they don't even realize that they yeah. are, just like you're saying. Mm -hmm. So as you look at these different punk names, is there anything that's like out of bounds for you or are you pretty all inclusive? Oh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's many that, that I haven't, aren't even, am not even aware of yet at this point that I'll get to have similar discoveries about. But as far as it goes, I, I love it all. I think it's all exciting and cool and interesting. Actually, you were the one when you had first approached me about doing this interview that um, introduced me to the term manor punk, which I thought was really fun. Um, so yeah, it's just like everywhere you turn, there's some, some really fun little niche that you can find within this genre. Yeah, absolutely. And Manor Punk, the reason why we're bringing that up is because of the specific time period that her work is in. So let's give readers who are not familiar with your work just a broad overview of both the punk-related work as well as the non-punk-related work. Yeah, so I basically started out as a totally a historical fiction writer. That was what I was doing for a long time. Um, several non-published books, including two published books before I got into um, more speculative stuff. And honestly, I think that history in itself, being a historical writer and writing about these historical periods, it has a very speculative vibe, a very fantasy vibe anyway, because really what we're doing is writing about these completely foreign times and places with these amazing costumes and these completely, you know, just foreign societal ethoses and that kind of thing. So it's really out there anyway. Um, and it's very, it lends itself very well to fantasy, which is why we see fantasy almost entirely taking on, you know, historical vibes kind of. But so as a historical writer, I got to the point where I'm like, uh, this is great. I love this milieu, but I really don't want to have to stick to the facts so much. I want to be able to you know, do what I want to do and not worry so much about historical accuracy. So as time went on, I sort of started blending more and more into um, sort of a, a cross between historical fiction and fantasy, which of course, that's the punk genre. You find almost all of these great um, historical steampunk and diesel punk and all of this that lends itself so well to bringing speculative elements into a historical setting. So it was tailor made for me and I just loved getting into it. So, um, but really my journey with steampunk starts with my um, portal fantasy Dreamlander, which is straight up fantasy. Um, it was not intended in any way as a historical novel, um, but it, it ended up having some steampunk aesthetics in it, um, steam-powered uh, aerial trains and steam-powered firearms, that kind of thing. So it was really just an aesthetic, but it was a lot of fun and I really enjoyed it because I feel like that kind of thing does a great job of grounding kind of the more airy-fairy magical aspect of uh, classic fantasy. So I really enjoyed playing with that as just kind of a slightly different vibe on the fantasy genre. And then from there I went on and wrote my diesel punk story, Storming, which diesel punk of course is set in, it's like steampunk, but instead of being set in the Victorian era, it's set in between the world wars. So you get the biplanes and all of that kind of cool stuff. So as with much of my punk genres, um, the stories are very grounded in the real world for the most part. And then I'm able to bring in these fantastical elements um, that kind of just contribute to the story. So for Storming, it was about a barnstorming pilot in middle America, and he ended up having to deal with uh, sky pirates in a weather dirigible that had a weather machine that they used to take um, small farming towns hostage. So that was just really crazy and fun and a lot of um, enjoyable moments in writing that. And then um, Wayfarer, which is the book that just came out, um, is Gas Lab Fantasy. So it's set in 1820 London, and I get to do Gas Lab Fantasy, basically, as I've learned, is steampunk's non-magical or non-tech cousin. So instead of focusing on the more technological aspects of steam powered tech, we get something that's more magical oriented or, which really ended up putting my story, more mad science. So it's 
it's just a slightly different take that, that creates the opportunity for lots of fun vibes within a historical setting. Yeah. And it's interesting because anyone who's followed this show, they've heard so many definitions about the different terms, but gas lamp is a really cool one because it does differentiate in that way. There are people who use steampunk as, or, you know, any of these punk terms as sci-fi or fantasy, but yet often I will see steampunk listed as sci-fi only. And so I think that's where possibly it grew from, but but I like the distinction and I like that it's just so descriptive, you know, mm-hmm. it's about the gas lamps of the time. Yeah, so, yeah. definitely. Sorry, continue. Well, that pretty much, that covers my, uh, my steampunk career up to this point. But um, at this point, I'm actually working on sequels to Dreamlander, which was the portal fantasy. So continuing with some more of the, the punk aesthetic within that as well. So good. Okay, great. And then anyone who hasn't, I don't think we've talked about portal fantasy on this show. So just in case anybody's wondering, it's just exactly what it sounds like a portal, a door, and it takes you into another world. Would you add anything to that? Nope. That pretty much sums it up. I use the, um, the trope of having it be a dream, uh, a world that was on the other side of our dreams that was represented by our consciousness when we go to sleep. But yeah, that's portal fantasy. That's so cool. Okay. I want to specifically talk about Wayfair. It's in the Georgian London era. And so that's a more unusual time. A lot of times we focus on Victorian instead of like the Jane Austen times, Napoleonic times in the earlier part of that century. So I was really interested in why you placed a superhero story in that particular place and time. And also what challenges or surprises it gave to you throughout the process of being the creator. Well, um, so I'm a big fan of the superhero genre. I really enjoy that. And actually, the the inspiration for Wayfair came to me when I was sitting on the couch watching the end of Spider-Man 2 for the upteen time and just had this random thought, why, why hasn't anybody done a historical superhero, which I would find out later, of course, to have. But um, we have this great historical aesthetic, you know, that seems like it's a mashup that's weeding happen. So of course, my mind just kind of took off from there. And the image I originally had in my head um, was I could see this guy in a like a long coat kind of, he was, he was like running and jumping across buildings. Originally, I was thinking, oh, this is going to be medieval, because um, that's a period that I've always been very interested in and that I've written about before in my book, Behold the Dawn. Um, but as I'm thinking about it, I'm realizing, you know, there's really no really tall buildings in the Middle Ages. So this is really not going to work if his powers are, are running fast and jumping onto tall buildings. So, but obviously I still want to be a historical aesthetic. So I kind of moved it along uh, a little later on as we're getting slightly taller buildings. Um, I think specifically why I ended up in the period that I did was just... I am a huge fan of classic films, Jane Austen, the Brontes, um, Charles Dickens, and just being steeped in kind of this period. Um, so it was just sort of a natural thing that, yeah, this is fun. I'm very familiar with this from the books that I've read, and it would just be a really fun thing to explore. Um, I ended up in the Regency primarily just because that was, uh, I had Jane Austen on the brain, and that was just immediate jump in that. And also because a lot of Charles Dickens movies are set in that period. And I love Dickens. Um, the book actually ended up becoming very much um, kind of my ode to Dickens. Um, for the people who are familiar with his his books, there's lots of little Easter eggs throughout. I ended up choosing probably 75% of the character names just based on really arcane uh, names from his books. So if you're familiar with Charles Dickens and you're watching, it's kind of a a fun little thing I hope that people can, can go through and realize like, oh yeah, that she, she totally ripped Charles Dickens off her. Okay, that is really, really cool. And I'd love to talk about structure in the context of your 1920s book, So Storming. And I know this is a passion of yours. So I specifically was interested in it for diesel punk and any of the punks. How has that changed compared to other things that you've written, how you approach structure? Well, I think that um, truly the most important thing to understand about um, structure, story theory, um, plot, character, theme, all of that is that it's very foundational to the shape of what we consider a story period. So it's always going to have this foundational archetypal aspect that we find across genres. 
So how um, structure affects different genres differently is actually something that I never think about going in. I'm always concerned about how can I create a story that adheres strongly to um, the story theories that create um, the most emotional resonance um, within readers. And from there, then I'm looking more for the, the exterior trappings, the, the fun settings and the milieus and, and more of the genre tropes. But structure itself is foundational under it all. I like to say that, that the question of character versus plot that you often hear bandied around uh, among authors is actually a really false paradigm because when they're done right, one creates the other. It's really difficult to have a strong plot, strong characters, or a strong, well-executed theme if you don't all have all three of them working together in synchronicity. I like to call them the trifecta. So from purely a structural aspect, it's no different for me in writing any of the punks or any kind of speculative fiction than it would be for a writing fantasy or writing um, historical or, or anything else, really. But specifically, some of the specific things that I do think about when writing um, any kind of a specialized genre like the punks is I want to make sure that I'm taking full advantage of all of the really fun, fantastical elements that are available within these genres. So one thing that I will do early on when I am in the outlining phase is I will make a list of what is of every single thing I can think of that's cool or fun or would be interesting to explore that would incorporate um, aspects of the genre, aspects of the specific characters that I'm dealing with, the time periods, the places, what, what would I be missing out on if I didn't, you know, come up with this and try to incorporate it into the story in an organic way? And something else that I'll do is I will also write a list of what will readers expect from a story of this type? If they're interested in this genre and kind of familiar with it, what are they, what are they going to think is going to be in this book? And then from there, I can take that list and use it both to say, yeah, I need to make sure I've, I've crossed this T and dotted this I and am providing this um, for readers who want it, but also a way to recognize that this has been done to death and I need to either skip it or figure out a way to subvert the trope and turn it on its head and make it into something that's hopefully really fun and original and interesting. Oh my, my goodness. You know, as I do these interviews, sometimes someone comes along and they say something in such a breezy like way, but <laughs> everything you just said has so much content in it. So I hope anyone listening, even though you, obviously Katie makes this sound very easy and very accessible and it is, but if you have a moment, just rewind and, and soak in what she just talked about, because as someone creating my own work, I, I could identify at least four things in there that I could take away and do right now. And I also know this is just the beginning and that there are deeper resources you can connect to to get more insight on what she just talked about. So very cool. Thank you. How long would you say it took you before you came up with your own way of plotting and structuring a story? Well, I've been writing a long time now. Um, <laughs> But truthfully, I think that for me, my education as a writer started when I started teaching writing, when I started blogging about it. And that's been 11 years now. And I would say within the last eight years, probably, I feel like I've, it's finally all come together for me. And it's no longer um, just a constant question of what is wrong with this thing? It's more like, oh, yeah, I totally see what's wrong and I know how to fix it, which is a really cool place to be in. But yeah, it's, it took me eight years of conscious study. And of course, before that, you know, there was lots of unconscious study going on. But I think it's, it's something that they, that write, the reason we're writers is because we love stories. So we are already just, we're absorbing stories so much more than I think even the casual reader or watcher of movies are. They're a part of us. And I think instinctively we understand what makes a story, what works and what doesn't. So even before I understood anything about story theory, structure, that kind of thing. I, I knew, I had a gut instinct about what worked and what doesn't in story. So I always tell writers that your secret weapon is your gut instinct. You just have to figure out what it's actually telling you. That is so wonderful. Thank you. 
so the next thing I want to talk about is historical research and sources. And you may or may not have a way that you go about selecting which sources you choose, but I did notice that you have a selected bibliography for some of your works on your website, which I love when authors do that. So how do you go about finding sources and how can you help people maybe stop spinning their wheels or going down rabbit holes when it comes to research? Well, obviously, I think that it is ultimately a very subjective question, depending on what you're researching. Um, but for me, how the process looks is, um, first of all, I'm a history buff, obviously. So there, I'm always starting, what, what draws me to a story in a historical period to begin with is an interest in it. So I have, I have some knowledge about um, what this story in this time is going to look like. Um, but the first thing I do is I want to know what the story is about. I don't do any major research until I've finished outlining the book so that I have a complete sense of where this story is going and therefore what questions I need to have, um, need to be able to ask and answer in the research phase. And that kind of gives me a shape for the bibliography that I'm going to need to put together. So at that point, I'll have a list of subjects that I know I need to research and um, figure out answers for. So for example, in Wayfair, I knew that I was going to need to know something about, uh, you know, general subjects like clothing and language, um, that kind of thing. I know the character goes to a ball, so I'm going to have to research that kind of thing. I am going to need to know some things about um, architecture because he's, you know, jumping around on buildings and I need to know materials that buildings would need, would be made of at this point. Um, I need to know about government. I need to know about the criminal underbelly in London, that kind of thing. So that gives me a shape um, and some points to start looking for books. And at that point, I don't have any secret sauce. I just, you know, get on my libraries, get on Amazon, and start looking for books that are going to be on the subjects that I need. Oh, another thing for Wayfair was that I needed to do a lot of research on the Bow Street Runners, which were oh, basically yeah. the, the very, very primordial predecessors of the police force in London, which was a lot of fun and I knew basically nothing about before I started researching. And some of those topics, you, they're really easy to find information on. Some of them you're not. You're lucky if you get one book and a Wikipedia article. But um, yeah, so I, then I'm, from there, I just, I go through the books. Um, depends how big the stack is. For Wayfair, I think I ended up researching for about a year before I was done with all the resources that I came up with. Uh, I really like to read ebooks instead of paperbacks if I can, because it's so easy to highlight on the Kindle, and then you immediately have it on the computer. You can go to your Kindle account on Amazon, find all your highlights, and it's so easy to copy paste the passages that you want to remember. I keep folders in Scrivener um, that are labeled by topic, um, and that way I can easily access. Um, all of the pertinent information that I've found. And another thing I do is every day as I'm actually writing the first draft, I will, before I start writing each day, I will read about a page worth of my research notes. It's just kind of a way to, to jog my memory and make sure that I'm not missing any of the good stuff that I found when I was researching. Oh, that's very cool. Thank you for the tie-in to your full process. That really helps. So let me next direct the audience to kmweiland.com and it's k-m-w-e-i-l-a-n-d.com because as you go to the about page, you'll see how many awesome ways she's shared her work. It includes NPR, Writer's Digest, as I've already mentioned, many others. I mean, you'll be scrolling several times to get through the list. So Katie, can you share a few takeaways about how creatives can put themselves out there? and make the most of marketing opportunities when they come. I know that you're creating them. They don't just come, but any advice there? Again, I, I do feel that's a subjective question because it depends you know, on the, what subject you're writing. I think that there are easier ends for some authors than others, depending on your material. In general, I think fiction writers, we have it a little harder just because we're not, there isn't an immediately obvious way to share what we're doing with our reading public in a way that that seems like we're sharing instead of just selling. Um, one thing I would say though, um, and I think this is good advice in the beginning of your career and not necessarily as time goes on, but that is never say no. And I, that was definitely something that I started out doing. I said yes to everything, interviews, guest posts, um, anything anybody would asked me to do, I would do. Um, and that's no longer a viable strategy for me at this point, just because it's, uh, that would be how I'd spend, you know, more time doing that than creating. And obviously that's not a good choice at this point, but I think in the beginning, you don't know wh what opportunity is going to lead where, and until you get to the point where you're able to choose, yeah, this is, this is the path I want to go down. 
I think it's good to be able to invest the energy into doing that up front. And if nothing else, it really builds, I think, the work ethic to put into the marketing, which is a whole different discipline from writing. Um, as we all know, it's, you know, the common lament among writers. Um, but if, if you are able to just take advantage of the opportunities that come your way, it's been my experience that more opportunities will come. So that would be the, the foundational piece of advice that I would offer. Oh, that's so good. Thank you. Just one last thing about the punks and diesel punk and steampunk, gas lamp fantasy. What have they taught you as a person, Katie? What do you hope that these genres teach societies as we head into 2019? To me, the fantastic thing about speculative fiction and specifically things like the punks is that they are, they're sheer entertainment. They're so incredibly accessible to people because they don't pretend to be anything except fun. They're popcorn stories. They're blockbuster movie type stories. That's what they are. So people turn to them just because this is fun. It's entertaining. But I think within that, there is this incredible opportunity because of their very accessibility to actually take that a step further and tell stories that have great depth and meaning and that really engage people on an emotional level. As a reader and a viewer, this is what I want. This is what I go crazy whenever I find because it actually is kind of rare. You, it's easy to find books that are entertaining and it's relatively easy to go out and find heavy books that have things to say. But I think it's relatively rare to be able to find that perfect marriage of both. And that's something that I really want to accomplish in all of my stories. Before I start thinking about genre, before I start thinking about anything, I'm always wanting to know why this story. What is this story actually about underneath all of the fun glitz and color and the interesting time periods? So... Again, it, kind of, it goes back to what I talked about, about the trifecta of character, plot, and theme. Because I think when those things come together, when plot is creating character and character is creating plot, theme arises out of that. And you're able to take readers on this really emotional journey that actually is saying something important about their own lives and the, the world that we live in, even if the story itself is set in this completely unrealistic milieu. So in my opinion, it's the speculative genres have this incredible power because they masquerade as fun. And yet underneath all of it, they have the power to speak very deeply and clearly on issues that affect all of us. Thank you so much for that time. You said it so well. Will you just direct people where you'd like them to go or any specials you have, anything like that? Um, yeah, so as you mentioned, I have what I call my author site, which is kmwyland.com, and you can find um, my books, my fiction primarily, and stuff like that there. If you're an author, you might like to check out Helping Authors Become Authors, which is the blog and podcast that I update weekly, um, where I talk more about um, techniques and story theory and just the writing life and things like that. And it's awesome. Um, my books are on Amazon, of course. And then if you, I'm on pretty much all of the social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, so... If you want to find me there, I am there. And other than that, I just hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for your time. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. So much to nerd out over, right? I hope you're enjoying it. As of this recording, I still have some steampunk coloring books. So if you have not yet left a review, please do so. Just take a quick screenshot or photo and then send that to me via email. Once again, if you're wondering how to email me, just join the newsletter. So you go to storypunks.world forward slash newsletter, and it all just goes from there. And then if you are interested in just checking out the comic, go to joebenitez.com. That's J-O-E-B-E-N-I-T-E-Z. And this is the Lady Mechanica series, the Lady Mechanica coloring book. Please get yours. There are limited quantities, but I'm sending these out as a free thank you because I do know it takes a little time. It can be a little circuitous. But it takes about five minutes, really, to leave a review. And we honestly have so many listeners that I would love to give back. If you can just take those couple minutes, that would really help us. And I would love to help you as well by giving you something to spawn your own creativity. You know, there's a lot that has already been said about what coloring can do for your creativity, just for your stress relief. Give it a try. This is the perfect opportunity. So other than that, I wish you the best with everything creative you're working on. 
everything life related you're working on. Maybe, you know, you're trying to adult. It's not easy. And I just wish you the best with everything you've got on your plate, everything weighing on your psyche. It's going to be okay. And we're just all going to keep going. That's the only rule in my book. And with that, I will just leave you to it. Have a wonderful weekend, a wonderful week.